My name is William Shatner. In this film, I play a government employee, the manager of the Social Security Administration's computer facility, the world's largest. He believes it was government, not the private sector, that was the main factor in giving this nation the highest per capita income in the world. All present and accounted for. Economic man, that is, and woman, of course. They're all here. Every American who earns a wage or has earned one since we passed our first Social Security law in 1935. Me? Call me 394-289-615. You'll find me right here on a reel of magnetic tape. I'm in charge of these records, and I suppose you might say mine is the face of big government. Most of us bureaucrats are doing an important job. We, we like the idea of service, helping this country. We're here because there's some job that needs doing which the private sector didn't want or couldn't handle or needed to be regulated while it was doing it. And do you know something? It's been that way from the beginning. Do you know who our largest single employer by 1793 was? It was the Treasury Department, that's what. And it had 1,700 people working for it. Now Treasury has 120,000 employees, and the federal government, taken all together, has 2,700,000 names on its payroll, which may be more than we need. Still, it didn't just happen. There's reason behind that growth, and a lot of it has made economic sense as well as human sense. Ours is a mixed economy. Government is an active partner in our growth. It has helped the economy to grow because we asked it to. As the economy has grown larger, more complex, so has the government. Boosting one part of the economy often means damaging others. When the government helps us, we think it's good. When it helps others at our expense, we think it's bad. The government does a balancing act. Its goal is still the greatest good for the greatest number. A goal that is often achieved. A mixed economy at the local level. In Camden, Maine, the town board of selectmen is spending $35,000 of tax money to dredge the harbor. Schooner captains get better anchorage. Public money has helped the private sector. In the long run, the town benefits. It keeps the charter boat business and the tourist dollars the charters attract. Have the captains that are going to use their schooners in those areas uh, been over to see uh, and observe some of that work? Yeah. I went down there specifically to talk to the man on the bars to make sure that there was no misunderstanding as to how far or how near to the railway that I wanted the dredging done because I was afraid that they might have the impression that I wanted dredged as near as the law would allow, which would be 10 feet, we'll say, so as not to undermine the railway. Yeah. But actually, I want nearer 15 feet. It's desirable to have some flat surface there for my float to ground out on and then a short gangplank from the float to the boarding ladder for the schooner. So I just went out to make sure that they understood that, and as far as I can see, they're doing a good job. He came in this morning to the scow to uh, scoop out for us, and there's going to be a scorner here and a scorner here. And he's got this berth almost all finished on this side here. And uh, he'll probably take out some here tomorrow. Our Boston forefathers built a common wharf where merchants could store their goods and ships could load and unload faster. Public funds helped Boston to be our first port. Our first Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin, argued that if public benefits outweigh private benefits, the public should pay. And the public has a right to know what it's paying for. Town meetings and public hearings guarantee that all interests are represented. About a foot and a half or two feet at a low drain tide. Well, I think then the, the project is finally getting along towards its end. We should have a good clean harbor and ready to operate well when springtime. It'll be an improvement anyway. Well, this is what we wanted. The Tennessee-Tombigbee Waterway, a mixed economy at the national level. 
The largest earth-moving project since the Panama Canal. Steel from Alabama can get to the Gulf of Mexico, coal from Kentucky to Japan, the entire southeast benefits. But other regions are unhappy. They rail against the nearly $2 billion project and call it a boondoggle. One lock costs $100 million. Competitive transportation systems complain. A railroad spokesman noted, Tom Bigby could pay for transporting Kentucky's coal to the Gulf by rail for the next 515 years. But nobody denies that the new waterway will help develop a less developed part of the country. Our government's first economic responsibility was to provide a framework of laws. Protection for private property, deeds for land, patents for ideas, and enforcement of contracts. In a market economy, someone must ensure that a seller delivers and a buyer pays. Washington, Jefferson, and Adams, as farmers, knew the value of settled land. They turned government frontier land over to private owners. The French and Spanish might have settled those lands. We did, and we grew. Later, Jefferson spent $15 million to more than double our acreage with the Louisiana Purchase. Without it, other nations might have limited our growth. Barbary pirates disrupted and all but cut off our trade with Europe. They tried to extort the same tribute from us that the British had paid. We couldn't afford it. We armed our ships, but that proved ineffectual. So we went to war over economics. Our Marines landed on the shores of Tripoli. Trade resumed. When the cannon came off our ships, making more room for cargo, we made the greatest percentage gain in shipping volume in our history. The American market was open to a flood of foreign goods. To encourage our fledgling manufacturers, we levied protective tariffs. Until the revolution, we depended on England for finished goods. We now wanted to be economically as well as politically independent. The income from tariffs was the government's main source of revenue until 1860. For much of the nation's history, local and state governments were the main source of ideas and money to help the economy. They built the canals. For instance, the Delaware and Raritan Canal, which connected Philadelphia and New York. It's deserted now, but it once was the nation's busiest. In 1864, it carried more than one million tons of freight. It's funny, isn't it, that more than a century later, we're still realizing benefits from the canals the first great public works project the government ever undertook. In the days before railroads, waterways were the only efficient way of moving heavy freight. So we decided to build a system of canals linking river to lake to river. They'll find that the riches of the west could reach the east. The job was too big and the profit potential too small for private enterprise. In the end, the government poured over a hundred million dollars into the canals. Most failed immediately because by the time they were finished, railroads which were developing at that time could go anywhere faster and didn't freeze over in winter. So canals in themselves played only a brief role in our economic history. What was important was the precedent that was established that in a country as vast and as various as ours was turning out to be, the government had an obligation to bring us together. There's not a form of transportation or communication from the jet plane to the Sears Roebuck catalog that the government hasn't subsidized or regulated to some extent. The government's job became more complex as technology changed and the need for speed increased. Peter National 428 is. Change one. Go ahead, man. Henson 29 VFR, 6,500. It sounds complicated, but to simplify it, uh, somebody asked me what I do for a living, I see I keep airplanes from bumping into each other. American 141 is cleared as filed. As the country shrank, the economy grew. People with ideas could move with the speed of sound. Businessmen could be anywhere in hours. 
Government invested in the airlines. It paid for planes and supported airmail routes. It built the airports and still runs them. It controls the airways and sets the rates. As soon as he's airborne, you'll hear the tower man tell him to contact departure control. That means that the pilot will once again change radio frequencies. And in a minute, he'll be talking to a radar controller who is located downstairs on the third floor. And he'll be radar controlled from this point until he reaches his destination. The government encouraged the railroads. It gave them 180 million acres of land. Railroads took us west, linked the country together, and gave us a national economy. By 1860, the United States had more than one half of the world's tracks. They connected us into an economic unit, the biggest single market in the world. In the rush to expand, the railroads overlooked passenger safety. In 1890, more than 7,000 people were killed in railroad accidents. Signal systems didn't work. Cheap tracks peeled up and pierced the floors of passing passenger cars. Boiler safety was inadequate. The government stepped in and for the first time set minimum safety standards to protect the consumer. The government's dilemma if you help the small town by making the railroads provide service, big city fares increase. If you help big city business with low fares, railroads can't afford to service the small town. The pendulum swings back and forth. Railroads are now getting $3 billion from the federal government to keep them running. It's the kind of situation in which the government often finds itself. Helping our early farmers by making cheap land available cut into the manufacturer's profits who had to pay more for labor. Protecting our early manufacturers with tariffs squeezed the farmer who had to pay more for finished goods. A mixed economy can be a mixed blessing. Still, without it, where would we be? Conflict is a part of our democratic process. We can only try to be as fair as possible. Try to make sure no one is hurt for too long. My name is Conrad K. Sear. I'm the, the United States bankruptcy judge in Bangor, Maine. It, it's my concern that for almost uh, 40 years, we have not seriously looked at our bankruptcy law. The courts that try to administer a law which is 40 years old uh, in a system, in a, in a climate, economic climate, uh, which is radically different than that when the law was created, is bound to be severely criticized and misunderstood uh, for the very good reason that it is being compelled to apply laws that no longer are relevant to the circumstances. We have a credit, consumer credit oriented economy, which is vital to the economic uh, prosperity of this country. It is on the strength of future earnings that we keep our factories running, uh, without which, if we suddenly stopped extending credit on a debtor's future earnings, we would suddenly bring this economy to a halt, because we would have to sell then only on a cash basis. We've always recognized as a nation that we wanted to encourage and provide an incentive for economic development and for risk-taking, because this is, this is part of the American system. It is a, a system in which we undertake to encourage and not discourage people uh, attempting new endeavor and uh, the rewards that go with them. And we don't place an eternal burden upon those who fail. Credit depends on agreement to pay and on a recognized medium of exchange. In early America, there was no common medium of exchange. Over 9,000 banks and agencies issued money. There was no way to trade outside your area or to be sure if you did that bills were genuine. 
counterfeiting flourished. Local banks illustrated their money with what they considered economically important. Farming, ranching, mining, railroading, shipping. Today's money has federal buildings on it, which illustrates my contention that government is the major factor in our economy. What's most important is that the federal government gave us a common currency and guaranteed payment. That is, if your money wasn't in a bank that closed during the depression of the 1930s. After the depression, there was the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the government standing behind the public's savings. The depression. An unstable economy collapsing. The numbers that got hurt were enormous. We asked the government for help, jobs, food, confidence in the future. The government responded with agencies that provided work and meals, agencies that regulated banks and markets, dollars to prime the pump and start us spending again. The economy recovered. The government's role expanded. Stability was our new objective. Growth was something to be planned. The economist came to Washington. Gross national product entered the language. All of this is a far cry from our early pioneers who made their own way west. The government eventually caught up with them and provided protection and education. The government was having second thoughts about its land policy. Too many inexperienced farmers were hacking at the land. The government responded by founding land-grant colleges to help the farmer survive and grow. They did a good job for the second and third generations. Education has always been one of government's largest expenses, particularly at the state and local level. In Kansas, it accounts for 47% of the budget. State and local governments now outspend the federal government for goods and services. D. Bernhardt, a legislative aide at the Capitol in Topeka comments. Your leader always has some uh, special interest in various topics, like, for instance, the uh, majority leader in the Senate is very much into education both uh, in the state and a national level. The intent of the bill is, is very commendable, but um, there's, there's a number of problems uh, with the way in which the money would be delivered to the states and the localities. Virtually every topic you can think of is covered in a state government. There's over a thousand bills a session introduced. There's a long process that every bill goes through. There are many points where a bill could be killed, and the impetus really is a status quo. So in order to change the status quo, uh, you have to be prepared. I told them not, they might not get any more money next year. We're going to put a freeze on it. And all that. They say, what, what do you people know about education? What do legislators know about education? They only fund it. They only fund it. They only have to appropriate it. And they only have to go back and explain it to their constituents. That's what I told them. They didn't like it. We have become an interdependent, interconnected nation. The highways began under the Agricultural Department to help the farmers get their goods to market. Roads meant business to a town. Highways multiplied. Between 1960 and 1970, local, state, and federal governments spent more than $140 billion for roads. That kind of expenditure helps an economy grow, a responsibility of any government. That's true for the nation or a town. It is not an easy task. Our streets do need paving and there we just can't afford it. We built a, a park which we needed in, uh, in its a fine addition to the city. But uh, I think we should take care of the basics first. And then if you have some money left over, well, you can uh, spend it for recreation and uh, this type of thing. But our streets are probably the number one priority right now. We don't have the money to start on the things. So, uh, 
it doesn't do much good to build a park if you can't drive down the road to get to it, you know. And this is kind of the situation we're in right now. Uh, Hatch, New Mexico, chili capital of the world. We grow the best flavored chili right here in the Rio Grande Valley of any place. They raise a lot of uh, chili around El Frito, Arizona, but uh, they prefer this chili to that over there or anywhere else, really. A lot of the people that live here live here for the reason that it is, it is a small town and uh, they know everybody and uh, they want to keep it just that way. Our community hasn't grown very much in the past 20 years, I would say. I believe there was a difference of oh, less than 10 in the 1960 and 1970 census, less than 10 people. People want big city services, but they want it to remain a town with a population around a thousand. They don't want to see the growth that come in here. They think that would tear down what we have in Hatch and a small community. So where do you go? Where do you make the, the division line and start to uh, have the money to pave your streets and have shopping centers and this type of thing, but yet do it with a thousand people? It just doesn't work. Number one, we don't have the labor force to attract an industry to come in here. We don't have the skilled labor that these people are looking for. We don't have uh, the housing to bring people in. And these are all things uh, you put the cart before the horse. You can't go out and build a bunch of houses hoping somebody will come in. You've got to have some, some reason here to, to build a house, and it's kind of a standoff one way or another. Our beginning as a nation was just as tenuous. We had declared and won our independence. But were we independent? Our first veterans wondered if they would receive the pay they were promised. Foreign governments wanted to collect the money they were owed. They had helped to pay for our weapons. Our ability to do business with the world was at stake. We had to establish ourselves. To the national debt, we added that of the states. The total, $77 million. We levied taxes and tariffs, ran a lean and inexpensive government. We were as good as our word. A lot has changed. The government's first task is still to provide for our security. But today, it is 60,000 times as big as when it began. So is the economy. The national debt is now $576 billion, mostly as the result of wars. As we grew in world stature, so did our commitments. This Air Force testifies to that. It is the third largest in the world. The wars mobilized our resources and brought full employment. The economy as a whole didn't grow. What grew was the government's response to demands made upon it. The Pentagon is today the single largest spender in our economy. Government as a whole dominates the economy. I'd almost say it is the economy. This is the post office. It has changed since it was founded in 1775. Its purpose is to promote interchange of ideas, information, news. Today, the post office has 750,000 employees and a budget of 14 billion but it is deficit-ridden. Apparently, not even technology can save it. It is a weathered monument to how we have grown and changed. Now, keeping track is the problem. Computers are the new medium of transport for government. Information is the resource to which we look for growth. And where do we look most often? Where do all the lines of our interconnected, interdependent, interwoven economy meet? On and on the computers go. They don't need any rest. They almost never break down. The only mistakes they make are the ones we make when we file up the programming. Our biggest single product in this country this day is data, information, facts. 
They, they don't seem to make us any wiser. Maybe it's just the opposite. Maybe all this information just confuses us. But here's some more to chew on. Almost a quarter of us wage earners now work for government, federal or state or local. If there's such a thing as a typical American of the 1970s, that means I'm it. That quarter in turn creates and consumes a third of our gross national product. So realistically speaking, it's silly to talk about a return to small government. We couldn't afford it. Probably couldn't even survive the transition. But that's not the point. The point is that the government has the biggest, most important job there is to do in this country. It has to guarantee our freedom. Now, that's a big word we use pretty carelessly, I think, but it does cover a lot of ground. We need protection from our enemies. That's obvious. We need the freedom to dream up new ideas, to try them out, and we need the freedom to fail, and that must apply to us all equally. That job has become terribly complex as the other institutions in our society have grown so huge, so lacking in human scale. The problem for big government and, and big business, big labor, big agriculture, big everything, is to become more responsive to our most pressing needs as individuals. I don't honestly know if government or any of them can do the job. But if we're around to celebrate the tricentennial, what we'll be celebrating is success at that task. Anyway, it's a goal worth aiming for. And something a clever bunch like us just might pull off. This is William Shatner again. There are many reasons why America grew. You've just seen one. There are others. In this series, I play five different roles so that you can decide for yourself how and why we grew 